are proud to present the 2019 Diamond winner. Drum roll, please. The house next door. By Joe A. Sutherland. We love connecting with readers, with students. Uh, it seems like a long time ago, but uh, that we, we could travel across the country, but uh, I used to travel a lot ac ac across Canada, visiting schools and meeting students such as yourselves that had participated in programs like this. So uh, this is a great substitution, you know, it's different for sure, but I'm so happy we still have these opportunities to connect. Uh, because I was so honored when The House Next Door was nominated, just let alone nominated, not to mention that when I found out that it won, which I still feel like I can't say that like out loud, but <laughs> since it hasn't been made public yet. But I'm so excited because I'll say this, this is actually the very first time uh, one of my books um, has been part of a reading program like this west of Ontario. A lot of the Haunted Canada books and a lot of my novels have been nominated for uh, similar programs in Ontario and in the Atlantic provinces, but never west of Ontario. And I didn't understand why. I thought, what, don't kids like scary stories west of Ontario? Of course they do. I've traveled west of Ontario all the time and people love Haunted Canada and these novels as well and stuff like Goosebumps. So to see it on this list and know that it was going to be read by so many students in Saskatchewan was just an amazing thrill for me. And I was completely shocked that when I found out just recently that I had won. Uh, there's some phenomenal books on that list. It's an amazing list of books. And uh, I was just, just thrilled because the thing I love about these types of programs too is that it's, it's you guys, it's the kids that are reading the books and picking the winners. It's, it's not just a jury of like three adults in an office somewhere getting together and saying, these are the best books of the year. These are the books people should read. Um, because to be honest, I don't really write books for people like that. I write books for people like you, the people that are here at the Zoom meeting with me um, that participate in these programs. I write books for kids. So I'm so happy that, uh, that you all got to read it, that so many other kids in the province got to read it and that you all liked it enough to vote for it for it to be the winning title so i'm just i'm just over the moon i can't believe it i'm i'm honestly shocked um so having said all that thank you again and thanks for joining me for this little talk so i'll definitely i, I want to leave most of the time uh just to, to answer any questions you might have and just to chat if you just want to tell me like what you've been doing during lockdown you know how things have been going i'd love to hear about that too that's totally fine but i thought i'd, I'd start with just a really short little talk about the book um, it is often one of uh, a one part of my bigger author presentation in which I typically start talking about Haunted Canada. And then I always start talking about these books as well, the Haunted books. So The House Next Door is the first book in the series. Um, there's been three more since, Kill Screen, Night of the Living Dolls, and Field of Screams. So it's up to four books and I've uh, just started working on the fifth now. Um, but it's not a series where you need to read each in order. You could just pick any, any book that you enjoy the sounds of and read it without having read any of the others. Um, they don't take place in sequence and each book is in a different city or town in Canada and a different group of kids dealing with some new paranormal activity, some sort of new threat. So you can read any one you like, but if you do read more than one, you'll start to notice some, I call them Easter eggs. They're the little, little hidden surprises sprinkled throughout the series, things that pop up a lot. Um, for example, the, the book series and, and television series that all the kids enjoy reading and watching is called Screamers. Sounds kind of like Goosebumps. That's intentional. It's definitely, definitely my version of Goosebumps in this series. Uh, but of course, it's a Canadian series. So in a way, it's actually kind of more like this series, Haunted. Well, this is getting really confusing. But the point is, that's one tie through all four of these books that everybody always talks about this book and, and television show called Screamers. 
Um, another thing is in this book, the kids play a video game called Kill Screen. And then there's a whole book about Kill Screen. And of course, that video game is mentioned in each of these books as well. Um, and there's a few, other, a few other little ties too throughout the whole series, which is really fun, I think, for, for anyone that does read more than one. And if you're really paying attention, you'll start to see some similarities. And I do have one sort of like big storyline in mind um, for, for why there's a lot of extra paranormal activity suddenly happening across Canada um, that is kind of actually mostly hinted at in Kill Screen. So if you read this one, um, there's a group, a really shadowy conspiracy theory type group called Memento Mori, uh, and which that's actually kind of neat. I'm wearing a Haunted Mansion shirt today from Disney World, which is my favorite. It's like the wall, this is the wallpaper at the Haunted Mansion in Disney World, which is my favorite all time ride in any theme park. And it's the reason why I think I like scary stuff so much to this day. My parents took me when I was really young and I absolutely fell in love with that Haunted Mansion, the Haunted House ride. Um, and Memento Mori pops up a lot in the Haunted Mansion at Disney World. It's a historical uh, phrase. I won't get into the details right now. But if you read Kill Screen, you'll read about a group called Memento Mori. They're kind of connected to all these stories as well. But again, you could just pick up any one book, read it, not pick up on all that, and it won't detract you at all from, from enjoying any of these books. Okay, so the house next door. What I want to tell you about is where I got the idea for this story. So I live in a suburban neighborhood about an hour or so uh, east of Toronto. It's called Curtis, and it is the, uh, the neighborhood that uh, is named in this book as well. So it's where I live. And there is a house. It's not this actual house. This is just a photo that the publisher uh, picked for the cover. But there is a really old, creepy farmhouse in my neighborhood. Although all the houses are, are pretty new, like my house is about 10 years old. I think the oldest house in the neighborhood is probably about 15 or 20 years old. Uh, and they're just constantly now building new houses and townhouses. There is this one old farmhouse right in the middle that is still there to this day, even though all the other farmhouses that used to be in this part of, the, part of where I live um, have all sold their property so that uh, developers could build new homes. There's this one house and it's super creepy. And I, I describe it exactly, it looks exactly like I described it in this book. Um, so a little different from the cover, but creepy old place, the blinds are always closed, there's never any lights on. Um, there is, like in the book, I think I talk about it, there's being a little like statues on the patio and the bench that, uh, like a, a swinging bench that creaks in the wind. Um, oh, and even a sign, there's a little sign at the end of the driveway with a silhouette of a horse. Um, all that's based on a real house in my neighborhood that I always just thought was really cool because it's super creepy. And it looks like it should be haunted, but it's surrounded by all these bright new, uh, you know, homes. And you never see like a horror story or a haunted house story set in a brand new home. It's always these creepy old places. So I thought it was neat to have this old creepy house surrounded by brand new buildings. And the other thing too is that's absolutely true is to this day, I've lived in the neighborhood, like I said, 10 years now. Um, I've never seen the people that live in that house. And I go past it a couple of times a day, whether I'm going for a walk or driving to and from work. So to this day, I've never seen anyone there, but I do see a horse. They do have a horse in the barn behind the house that comes out every now and again and wanders around the field and goes back into the barn all on its own. And that's weird because maybe, you know, if it was, if there was no animals, no barn, and if you never saw anyone in this old house, maybe they're kind of just shut-ins and they don't venture out too often, or maybe it's just a coincidence. But to have an animal uh, that you have to tend to and care for and feed and ride and everything else on your property, and for me to see that animal regularly, the horse, but never see any people, I, it's just such a weird coincidence, just a fluky sort of thing. And it was starting to creep me and my kids out as we'd go walking by. We're like, who's looking after this horse? Like, do we feel bad for this horse? Like. What is going on? And we started asking ourselves what was at the time seemed like kind of silly, goofy questions like, what if it was a ghost horse? What if it was a zombie horse? What if it was a zombie ghost horse? Which was totally ridiculous. That was my idea. That was too far. Uh, in fact, I think I have one of the kids in the, in the school uh, say that, you know, one of the friends that Matt and Sophie make uh, say that there was a theory that it was a zombie ghost horse. And that was just totally ridiculous. That was my theory for a little bit. But my kids and I were asking ourselves these what if questions. 
which if you want to be a writer is one of the best things you can ask yourself, what if, right? And you fill in the blanks. You take real things in your neighborhood or in the current events that, you know, things that are, you read about in the news or things you read about uh, that have taken a long time, a place a long time ago, something in history. You take something real and you ask yourself, what if questions and you invent a story, you, you expand from there. Um, if I was doing my full author visit, which I'll kind of cap here so we can get into questions, I would then go through like where I got the ideas for the other books and, um, and talk about how, how easy it is to come up with story ideas because ideas are everywhere. Like all my books, even though they're obviously make-believe, they're not based fully on reality, they're all inspired at least by something that's real, like a house in my neighborhood, uh, or Kill Scream is just inspired by uh, my love of video games, of playing games. Um, and also I'll say this, like I love movies about video games coming to life, Wreck-It Ralph, Pixel, Jumanji, so much fun when either the game comes into our world or people in our world get sucked into the games world. I love stuff like that. And I thought, what if it was a scary game, right? Um, now the Living Dolls was, inspired by uh, a lot of my Hanuk Anda research. So I've written about real Canadian possessed dolls three times now in Hanuk Canada four, six, and eight. Um, and again, real stories about dolls in Canada that are believed to be haunted. And every time I would go visit a school, if I was talking about one of those books, four, six, or eight, everybody either said they loved that story the most or they hated that story the most. I realized that people had really big um, feelings when it comes to haunted dolls. They either love them or they hate them. There's no one in between. It's just like, nah, I'm kind of neutral on it. People either love them or hate them. So I knew that would be a fun thing to write about. So again, this was based on some real Canadian history, some real places, some real paranormal encounters that uh, came up with the whole novel. And Fuel Screams is actually based on a real event that happened to me where I took my kids into a corn maze during a fall farm event. And uh, they were really young at the time. They were like four and three years old. And they turned a couple of corners and I couldn't see them for like seven seconds. And as a parent, I freaked out. I really shouldn't have because they were fine. But I panicked, I lost my mind. I went chasing after them. I turned the corner and saw them. They looked at me and they're like, what's wrong with you, dad? And I was totally freaked out, totally scared. And although it was kind of an overreaction, I knew that I was onto something there too, because anytime something happens to you in real life that elicits a big emotion, whether it's fear uh, or even just happiness or sadness, um, anything along those lines, any big emotional reaction you have to something that happens to you could be a basis for a really good story. And it doesn't have to be a scary story. It doesn't have to be horror. It could be anything, any type of story. If you ask yourself, what if questions? So that's what I tell people, you know, I go through my books, I tell them all the different ways you can come up with ideas uh, for your own stories. As long as you're just always looking uh, at the world around you, keeping your mind open to it uh, and, uh, and asking yourself questions about, okay, that's interesting, but what if this happened next? You'll find that story ideas are actually everywhere. Teacher. Okay, um, what got you like interested in writing? Oh, great question. Yeah. So I'll never forget when I was probably I was about your, your age, Isaac, when uh, I went to scout camp. I loved scouting as a kid and I'm a volunteer scouter now with my son. And um, I'll, I'll never forget this one camp I went to where I was there for the week, scout camp one summer. And at the very end, uh, on like the last Friday night, all the leaders um, had to come up with a fun Friday night activity. And you would sign up as a scout you know, as one of the scouts, you'd sign up for what you wanted to do. And, uh, and there were a lot of fun options. The one that I was drawn the most to was scary ghost stories around the campfire. Um, so I went, I sat there with my friends that I had made that week. And the, the leader that uh, told the stories was so good. I'll never forget it. Because, you know, the story he told, actually, I've forgotten the story. I don't even remember the story at all. It was one of those stereotypical, like, I don't know, there was either a hitchhiker or somebody with a hook hand or the, the details aren't important. What is important is the way he told the story. So he would use really creepy voices and he would pause for dramatic effect. He would do sound effects and he really brought the story to life. And I think from a young age, I realized that uh, the power of storytelling uh, often not comes from just the plot, what happens. Obviously that is important. 
but it's the way you put your own unique spin on that story. So fast forward about a week or two later, I uh, was back home and it was another weekend and I was having a sleepover at a friend's house. There were three of us, me and two buddies. And it was about midnight. We decided we were camping out in his backyard. We decided, let's take turns telling scary stories. And so it came to me and I thought, I didn't have anything else to tell. So I was like, I'm going to tell that same story that that scout leader told. And I'm going to try and do what he did with like the voices and the pauses and all that. And, uh, and it went really well. Um, my other friends hadn't been at that scout camp, so it was all new to them. And uh, I didn't realize how well it went until my friend reached into his pocket and put into my hand a dollar coin. And I said, what's this for? And he said, that is for telling the scariest story I've ever heard. And again, the story itself wasn't that scary. It was the, the delivery, the style, right? And uh, so I was, I was hooked from that moment on. I thought, oh my goodness. I, you know, I have power if I can like elicit emotions out of an audience, whether it's by telling a story or writing a story, it gives you a bit of power, which is fun and exciting and people will pay you for it. I got paid a dollar. It was the first time I actually got paid for my writing. (laughs) I was your age. I I didn't think at the time I grew up to be a writer. I just thought, well, that was fun. And I continued writing um, just as, you know, a hobby, just as something to do. Um, but it wasn't until I was an adult that I was like, okay, I want to be, I want to take this a bit more seriously and really start sending stuff out for publication. Yeah. So thanks for asking. That was great. How do you come up with names for the characters in your books? Wow. Yeah, that's a great question. You know, I'm surprised. I don't think I've ever been asked that before. <laughs> You'd think that, that I would have been with all the visits I've done, but that's a new one for me. And that's a really good question. Great, great job. Yeah. Um, okay, so most of the time, I do try and like pick a name that is somehow representative of the character. Uh, so if it's one of the protagonists, one of the heroes of the story, one of the main characters, one of the, the good people, um, I often like to pick names that if you were to then Google the name uh, and see like where that name came from and what the meaning is, you'd find good characteristics. You know, like all our names have meaning, right? You can Google our names and find out where it comes from and what the meaning is. Um, And so I'm looking for like, you know, if somebody's brave, if a name means the brave one or uh, the virtuous one or uh, something along those lines, like good characteristics. I usually pick names like that for for my main characters. And obviously for the villains, I wanna pick names that have like somewhat sinister, meanings uh so if you looked those up you'd find out that uh you know there's a bit of a dark history behind that name often too like in a lot of my books there's twists i love having i love working in twists to these stories and uh sometimes who you think is good ends up being bad and vice versa so often those names might actually they might they might reveal, you know, it might be someone you think is good, but then is bad. And if you had looked up the name early on when you're reading the book, you might find out, hey, why is this good character have a name that like actually has a dark history, right? But other times I do like kind of the opposite. I try and throw people off and, uh, and I'll pick like um, a, a name that has a bit of a dark history for actually someone who's good. So it kind of keeps people on their toes just in case. And I often wonder, I'm like, does anyone actually do this? Does anyone take the time to go look up the name meanings? Maybe some do, I don't know. And I just always figure that, again, I love Easter eggs. I love little hidden surprises because maybe you're like me too. When when I really love a book or a movie or a game, a video game, I love uh, going online and researching like hidden meanings found in it. There's so many, YouTube is the best. I wish YouTube existed when I was your age. Obviously didn't because I love now watching YouTube videos about my favorite books and movies and finding all these hidden things that you didn't know about the story or the characters or their names. Um, so yeah, so there are often uh, hidden meanings behind the names. Great question. Um, when you're like writing books, how do you keep track of all of your ideas for it? That's challenging. That can be tough, especially because I'm often working on two or three or four or five books at the same time at different stages. So I might be researching stories for the next Haunted Canada book um, while I'm outlining a novel 
while I'm writing another book and editing another one, like, cause it's all in stages, right? Um, and, and so it's tough. So what I do is, uh, and I've started doing this, I'll say, I actually only started doing this recently. Um, I use a lot of spreadsheets now uh, to keep track of, of uh, all the important information for each book. Um, so all the character information and the different things I need to happen in the plot to have a satisfying story where I want to get the story to at the end. Um, information about the setting and other details like that that I'll need to know. So I, now I do keep track of it in different spreadsheets and Word files, Word docs. Um, I used to be more of what authors call a pantser. They, there's an expression, it's either you're a, you're a plotter or a pantser and plotters do what I just said. You know, they, they write everything down, they plan it all out, they do outlines, they have charts and graphs. Um, pantsers are, are people that just fly by the seat of their pants, that old expression, right? So you just sit down, you open up your document or you get a notebook and you just start writing and you don't really have a full plan. You're just diving in and seeing what happens. I used to do that more often and that's, it's fun because it's very creative and like you're, you're, it's interesting even for the writer because you don't know what's going to happen next and you kind of want to sit down and write and see what happens and it's different you know every day but I found the more that was fine when I was just working on one book at a time or maybe two but now that I'm working on more and more books I really have to be more of a plotter to keep it all straight because it, it's challenging it can be tough so I found you know I, I thought that it would be um, doing all that work would maybe be a little more restrictive to my creative process, but to be honest, I actually found the opposite. It actually frees me up to be a little more creative in other ways. So I'm not spending as much time when I'm sitting down to write, thinking what should happen next or having to go back and refer to, wait, who said what and what did that person look like and everything else. I don't have to worry about that. I can actually focus more on some of the other creative elements of writing. So it's actually been pretty, pretty a fun, fun way to write. And then my last question is, what is your favorite book? Oh, my favorite book, probably The Lord of the Rings. Probably, yeah, the, if I had to pick, if I'm going to be, I, see, I often cheat, pick a series. Um, but if I had to pick one in The Lord of the Rings, I'd go with The Fellowship of the Ring. I just love the opening in the Shire so much. It's so descriptive, and it's just setting up. You could tell it's like, it's, it's sound, it seems like uh, if you didn't know what was coming later in the story, it seems like um, a very calm, peaceful opening, but it's setting up this huge epic adventure that's about to follow. So I absolutely love that book. I've read it, read it a few times. I'm a bit of a slow reader, so I typically don't read a book more than once. Um, it's very rare for me to do that. And I've read The Lord of the Rings a few times now. Um, what inspired you to write a story? Yeah, so uh, like I said before, you know, ideas are kind of everywhere. Uh, whether it's a house that I, you know, would walk past and wonder what was really happening there or something scary that happened to me or something in Canadian history I had researched. So ideas are kind of everywhere. Um, otherwise, I'd say, too, though, that I find a lot of inspiration. Uh, I mentioned this a little bit with Kill Screen, but I find a lot of inspiration in other people's books and shows and movies, games and music and art. Uh, so other uh, artistic uh, endeavors that people, that other you know, artists are, are uh, creating. So I've, uh, mostly though, it would be books, movies, and shows. Um, I'll, I'll read a book or I'll watch a movie and I'll think, uh, that was really cool. How would I have done it differently? And I'll start thinking about uh, new stories inspired by other people's stories. And actually, you know what? There's a lot of writers uh, working today, very successful, popular authors that got their start writing fan fiction. So they were inspired by uh, books and movies, and then they started writing original stories with those characters. You can't sell them, you can't make any money off of them because it's copyrighted, but you're allowed to post it and for other fans to read and enjoy. And so a lot of writers got their start that way. They started copying other writers' styles and by doing that, you start to then develop your own style. Uh, so it's a really common thing in a lot of the arts is that when you're starting out, you copy other people and that's how you learn. You're just playing, you're having fun. 
and you start to develop, develop in the case of writing, you start to develop your own voice. Great question. I love these questions. You guys are, you guys are just rocking it. <laughs> um, if you would make another book, where so you got muted just at the tail end, but you were saying, if I would make another book, what would it be about? Is that, yeah, okay, this is fun. Because like I said, um, I recently just signed the contract for the fifth book in the Haunted series. So I haven't even announced it online anywhere um, publicly, uh, but I will soon. Uh, but I can start talking about it a little bit with you guys. And so the fifth book in the series is called The Scream Queen. And remember how I mentioned uh, that show and book series called Screamers that shows up in all the books starting with House Next Door? So the Scream Queen is all about screamers. It's actually all about one of the, uh, the actors, the young actors, a uh, girl named Zoe Winter, who's mentioned in this book and I think a few of the others. Um, and in the books, uh, yeah, definitely in this one, there's a scene where the characters are talking about one particular episode where the actress, Zoe Winters, who's the same age as the kids in all these books, she's about 14, um, where she seems like extra scared. Like, it's, she's a good actress, but this is like her finest performance. Um, and so the fifth book in the series is gonna be all about the filming of that particular episode. And of course, you're gonna find out that the reason she seems so scared in that episode is because she literally is actually that scared for her life while filming because they're filming in an old abandoned uh, amusement park. And uh, it turns out that that amusement park is actually haunted. All the ghosts aren't just special effects in that episode. So I'm really excited about it. I love, I mentioned Disney World. I'm wearing a Disney World Haunted Mansion shirt. My favorite thing to do almost, you know, beyond writing is probably going to theme parks, uh, you know, whether it's Canada's Wonderland here north of Toronto, near where I live, or going uh, to other, other theme parks across Canada or in, in, uh, in the States. So I'm, I'm super excited for this one. And it, and it kind of more than any of the other four books ties them all together. I always plan for it to be the fifth because, like I said, it's something that's been mentioned in all of the other four books. Uh, so, so I'm pretty excited to start working on that one. You guys got the first sneak peek in the, in the country <laughs> of anyone in the world. Nobody else, nobody else knows about that book yet other than me, my agent, and my editor. <laughs> and now you. So that's pretty fun to be able to share that. Good time and good question. Um, what is the process of making books? All the process. Well, uh, so I mentioned my editor and my agent right now. So I write the book and either you you can either sometimes get a contract uh when you've finished the book or sometimes before you've written it so um you could write an outline and like a cover letter to tell somebody what the book is going to be about and they might uh they might buy the book before you've even written any of the book yet um that's pretty rare i mean that i when i started i had to actually write the book and send it in you know um so that the publishing company would know that, yeah, this, this person would actually finish the book and it would be a book we'd want to publish. But obviously, since I've done a lot of books with Scholastic now, I typically, like with the Scream Queen, can just give them a description of the book, a short little synopsis, and that's enough. Um, so then I write it, I send it to my agent, to my editor, and they give me some feedback. And mostly my editor will give a lot of feedback. Um, and we work back and forth. Uh, you know, no book is written alone. Every book needs lots of people involved to make it better. Uh, other people at Scholastic will help with the editing too, just to make sure that we catch, you know, as many mistakes as we can um, and just really do improve the book. So lots of editing back and forth. And then they take care of uh, designing the cover and there's often illustrations that go along uh, in the book. And each of the books has a few different illustrations throughout. They take care of all of that. And then usually about a year later or so, your book comes out into stores. How long does it take you to write a book? So writing the books varies based on what the book is. Um, Haunted Canada, because I've written so many of them and, uh, and they're pretty, you know, they're pretty similar, each one. Um, so those I've got down to kind of a science where um, researching uh, takes typically about 
two months. Writing takes typically about two months. And then editing, that takes a lot longer. Because of course, there's the back and forth between me and the editor. So it's just, you know, a bit of a longer process. That usually takes uh, probably about four months. So that's about, you know, six to eight months, somewhere around there for a Haunted Canada book. Um, the novels are a little different. Each book presents its own unique challenges. Um, so they vary. Um, I would say each of the haunted books probably took me probably about eight months at least, maybe a little bit more, maybe closer to 10 or, or 12 months to write. But as I mentioned before, I'm often writing a few at the same time, like they're at different stages. So that's how these books were all able to come out pretty close together. Like the first two came out on the same day. We released uh, The House Next Door and Kill Screen the same day. Uh, so that right away, people would know it's a series. You know, it wasn't just one book, it was two. That was important for us, uh, me and my publisher. And uh, then the next two came out, I think uh, this one came out about six months later. And I think this one came about six months later as well. We wanted them to be pretty close together as well. So, you know, I was, I was writing, maybe at one stage, I was probably like editing this book, finishing writing this book, um, starting writing this book and outlining this book all at the same time. And then finally this one was done and edited so I could finish up editing on this one and it cleared the decks, so to speak. So yeah, each, each probably is over the course of about a year. So all together, but it was overlapped, right? If that makes sense. Good question, thank you. Okay, um, why did uh, exactly why did you write the book well that's a good question too people oft, often ask me like why do i write scary books you know and uh, i think if you're asking why did i write the book and it is a scary book it's kind of hand in hand um i've mentioned a few stories you know on a mansion that camp counselor at the scout camp there's been a few things like that throughout mostly my childhood that really just made me love spooky stories um another was reading Goosebumps, they started coming out when I was a teenager. Um, I eventually, you know, got into reading stuff like Stephen King, a little bit scarier when I was a bit older. Um, and the other big thing too, that I have to mention, where I think I got my love for writing scary books, was, uh, I'll never forget, one of my first movie theater experiences was going to see Ghostbusters. I think it came out when I was like five or something. I was pretty young. Um, and my, I have two significantly older brothers and they would take me to all these really cool movies. So I, yeah, I would go see like kid movies, anime movies, Disney movies, uh, which I loved, but I would also get to go to these like slightly more mature spooky movies like Ghostbusters. I remember them taking me to see like the Indiana Jones movies, um, stuff like, stuff like that. So, uh, so yeah, Ghostbusters, I think more than just about any movie of my childhood left a really big mark. Again, I was just thrilled uh, by, by scary stories about ghosts. I just, I, I was a little scared about it, but I was more excited than anything. I just found it thrilling uh, more than, I guess more than scary really. And it was a fun experience. And like I said, eventually I started like being interested in telling my own scary stories and seeing if I could get the same reaction out of people, whether I was telling story or they were reading one of my stories same reaction that I had when I watched Ghostbusters or when I went on the Haunted Mansion or when I read a Goosebumps book. And so, yeah, as an adult now, um, it's just something I still really enjoy doing. So I, I have a lot of fun writing scary stories. <laughs> sounds kind of weird. <laughs> I have fun scaring people. But again, it's all, you know, from the safety of reading a book. Because if anyone gets too scared, they just put the book down. It's not something that's, you know, they, they're going to be forced to read if it's not something they'd be interested in. There's so many books out there, so many great books. People will find what they're interested in. Uh, so, yeah, so it's a lot of fun. When did you get the idea to write the book? So, uh, I'll tell you this, which I didn't mention. Um, I kind of got the idea for the whole series. Actually, this is a true story. On the way to this experience, the corn maze experience with my kids. Um, my wife and I take my kids up to this fall farm north of where we live, out in the country, very beautiful, very scenic. Of course, it was the fall, so the trees were all changing colors. We were thinking about Halloween, and 
we started talking about, about Goosebumps. Here we go again. Um, it's kind of one of the reasons why I wanted to make my own sort of Goosebumps series in this series, the Screamer series. Um, and we were talking about Goosebumps and how it was so popular when we were younger and it's still so popular today. And yet there's really not a lot of other books like it. You know, there's not a ton of horror series for, for you know, readers of this age. Um, let alone the fact that there's like almost none set in Canada. I, I can think of like a couple of other authors that are writing middle grade horror novels. Uh, Marina Cohen, who's a, a really good friend of mine, who also loves the Haunted Mansion. We actually met up once at Disney World just by coincidence and went on the Haunted Mansion together uh, with our families, which was super cool. Uh, but she writes really great uh, horror stories for kids your age. So I would check her out if you like the house next door. She wrote The Doll's Eye and uh, Box of Bones um, and a bunch of others too. Um, and uh, and you know, there's like a couple others that have written like one or two horror books, but they write a lot of others as well. And so my wife and I were thinking, you know, there really should be like a Canadian Goosebumps series. And immediately we thought, you know, I'd written a lot of Haunted Canada books and, and, a, and a couple of scary standalone novels for Scholastic. And immediately we obviously thought I should be the one to write it, right? It makes sense. And I thought, yeah, that'd be a ton of fun. So we started just bouncing ideas back as we were driving to this fall farm. We were, we were saying, hey, there's that creepy house in the neighborhood. I could write about that. And hey, I love video games. Kids love video games. What about I, wrote a I write a story about a really scary video game coming to life? Dolls, same thing. Got to have a doll, like a haunted doll story. And, uh, and then as I said, we got to the farm. And my kids got out of my sight for a few seconds and I got really freaked out and thought, I gotta write a story about that too in this series. So uh, all of this came about one fall, driving to a fall farm. Uh, it's where we came up with the idea of the series and like the first few books. Um, that was probably, I think about three years ago now or so, maybe three and a half, yeah. So that was, that's when this whole thing kind of came to be. And, and I knew early on, that I wanted a Goosebumps style series. And eventually I would have one book all about that show. So there we go. Now we're up to number five, which is going to finally fulfill that uh, original idea I had. Um, and where did you get the inspiration for the characters? Oh, that's a great question too. So uh, Matt and Sophie, um, <laughs> I'm in real life, I'm more of a Matt. And even though I'd like to be more of a Sophie. So I did that deliberately. Matt uh, is a little, a little more, how do I say this nicely? Cautious. I'll say cautious. Uh, he's, the, the not so nice way to say it is he's a bit more of a scaredy cat, <laughs> right? Um, he's the older brother, and yet it's his younger sister that just charges right over to the house and insists on knocking on the door to find out what's going on with this horse because she needs to know. She needs answers. And I'm in life, I've always really um, been uh, kind of impressed by people like that. I've always thought that's a, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, that's a really good characteristic to have. Um, and, and that's not what I'm like at all. I'm a bit more like, I'm just gonna be over here minding my own business. I don't need to know what's going on at that house with that creepy horse. Like, it's not concerning me it's none of my business um but you know because a big part of me does want to know too i'm impressed by people that would just take it into their own hands and go solve the mystery right so i'm more of a matt sophie's more of like who i'd kind of like to be and i like that that dynamic that you would have these this brother and sister one is a bit more forthcoming and a little the other is a little more hesitant so it created a fun little dynamic between the two as they were getting pulled closer and closer into the mystery and the danger of what happens throughout the book. It's my pleasure. I've, I've had an absolute blast with this. Would have loved to have come and met you and some of your fellow students in person, uh, but this is the next best thing. And maybe one day, maybe one day I'll get to, to visit and meet some <laughs> of you in person. That'd be amazing. Um, congratulations. Thank you. Oh my goodness, I still can't believe it. <laughs> I forgot who the talk that I won, my goodness.